Hello everyone and welcome back. Today is a very interesting episode, or at least I think it is. It's, it's a pretty complicated process that I want to share with you on how I raise a lot of my animals. And I think that a lot of people will disagree, but I've been doing this for about a decade without any problems when it comes to this. And I'm talking about cohabilitation. The reason that I like to do it sometimes, the reason that I wouldn't do it, I've already told you the big reasons that you shouldn't. I made that video first, just so that people know that for the most part, I don't think that you should cohabilitate your animals. Cohabitate, cohabilitate, I don't know which word to use. The there, There's so many issues and things that can go wrong, so it is better for people not to, for the most part. I'm gonna now tell you what I do, and this isn't the right thing to do, and this isn't what I'm saying you should do, but I'm just gonna share with you the system that I use and what's worked for me, and my thoughts behind it, and the whole process from baby to adult. And uh, if, you've, if you've spent time with me in person, then you'd probably already know this, but for other people, it's, it's just a different way of doing things. And once again, it's not the right way. I'm not telling you that you should do this. But this is kind of how I've done it and what works for me. In general, when people are raising baby snakes, they'll raise them in homes like this. So it's nice, it's simple, it's easy to keep clean. And one of the most important things with babies is to keep them sanitary and clean. Because they're more sensitive, especially for like the first year of their life. There's so many things that could go wrong. And even if, as an adult, you did set them up in a beautiful bioactive home with more than everything that they need, I still suggest that babies be raised in an environment that's more sanitary and clean like this. Because in something like this, nothing can really go wrong. The moment you put them on substrate, there is the possibility of them ingesting substrate and having issues. And I've seen several times, I've sold snakes to people, they've put the babies on substrate, and then they've had issues, had to go to the vet, had problems. So I'm not saying that it's bad, I'm saying that when they're young, they're weaker. And even as adults, when you're feeding them on substrate, I would say have a frisbee, stick the rat on the frisbee and feed them like that. You see, I could put the babies in homes like this. I don't really like doing it. And the thing that I find is when you have a baby alone in a home like this, the, usually the only time that they're really expecting to see you is when you feed them. So there's no movement, there's nothing. Even though sometimes it could make them feel secure, other times it can just make them kind of scared. So it's just like they're kind of scared all the time and you go in to grab them, they're kind of a little scared. You go in to feed them and they're a little bit scared. Now, it's also important to understand that every snake is totally different. Each snake has individual personalities. So are there, there are some snakes that won't want to be with other snakes at all. Instead of raising snakes in a home like this, I would rather raise them in groups of usually two to four. So I'll raise my snakes in kind of groups of two to four. And I find with the ball pythons, they don't do as well being raised together. So with ball pythons, I will raise them like this, because I'd rather have two little snakes growing in a big environment like this than in two little environments like that. And lots of the time, the ball pythons, they're hiding. So we have uh, two sisters there hanging out and I'm raising these two girls together. It doesn't actually make things easier. In a lot of ways, it ends up making things harder because I have to check twice as often. Because if one of them poops, you, you, the other one poops. But since they're on the same feeding schedules, usually I know about when they're gonna poop. So I'm like, I feed them. And when I do feed them, I do separate them. So I separate them, I feed them. I let them sit for kind of two, three days. Then I put them back together. And then in about three days, usually, they'll make a poo. And I'm, I'm very in tune with these things. So you have to understand that because I live here, I'm usually checking them every day. 
it isn't something that you would do if you're not going to be on it and watching them all the time. So now let's look at the boas. Same thing. So here we have a group of boas and uh, they're hanging out together and people will say sometimes, you know, they're fighting. See, they're not even, they're not even using their hide. Lots of the time boas are not hiders. And this is another thing where it comes down to individuals. So sometimes there's individual snakes that will want to hide and those ones should be given hides. But I find for the most part, boas are not using their hides. If, if we look at any boa home, most of them don't have hides because they never use them. And if you look at ball pythons, lots of them always use their hides. The thing that happens when they're together is they become used to movement. So they're, they're around each other and they're not as scared. So they're not as fearful. Because if they were alone, they'd have no contact with anything, and then they're basically scared all the time. So the moment anything moves, they're ready to kill it because they think it's food. But when they are raised together in these small groups, where it's controlled, where I can keep everything still sanitary and clean, I don't have any problems. The biggest reason that I don't have any problems is because when I feed them, I separate them, I put them in here, so I put them separately, I feed them, I leave them alone for three days, make sure that that food is eaten, that it's already kind of started, started digesting, where I'm not going to put them together and they're going to like strike each other or anything. If you were to kind of just feed them and then put them back together, you'd probably end up with problems with them biting each other. And this is, this is going to be the biggest problem with cohabilitating animals, that they will want to eat at the same time and try biting each other. So if they're fed properly, they're not going to be super hungry and they're not going to be twitching at everything that moves. So it's another thing that's very important. They're always fed on schedule. There's never one that's hungry while the others aren't. They're all being fed at the same time. So here, let's look at another group. And once again, they're not, no, there was one hiding and the rest of them are there. They're all hanging out together. But what I believe that this does is it desensitizes them. So they're not, they're not sensitive to movement. They're not, they're not as twitchy. They're not as scared. So where people say that if they're together, they're fighting over space, you're stressing them out and it's not good for them. To me, if they're stressed out, if they aren't happy, if things are not good with them, they're not going to eat. When I do this, I'll tell you, 95% of the snakes do well. There will always be, you know, every couple litters, there'll be a snake where it stops eating. So then, yes, that snake is stressed out possibly, and then I'll separate it. I'll find this a lot more with ball pythons and boas. I'll show you another thing that's kind of interesting. Another example is, well, I had a ball python living in a home like this. And now always, I want to give them more space. So they grow there, then they move up to the bigger one, then they move up to the bigger one, and then eventually they move to a big one of these. And I, I wish I could give them even more than that. All you can do, especially as a breeder, is give them the best that you can. And I do the very best that I can to keep them as clean as possible and give them the best lives that I can. And to educate people that are taking them so that Hopefully when they get a snake that they're not just going to stick it in a drawer I don't really want my snakes to go from a drawer to a drawer I want them to go to someone that's going to give them a big beautiful home And it's something that I didn't really even think about as much years ago And now because of learning more and also just seeing firsthand How much personality each snake has because then there are the cases so it's just like I will have Let's look over here. So like I said, we have a ball python. He's hiding. So you see the size of him towards his enclosure? Like, it, it's fair. It's He's not squeezed in a tiny thing. He can go hide. He can stretch out. But most of the time, he will be hiding. Anywhere that I have ball pythons, they're almost always hiding. I have one boa, and she is a leopard boa. She's always hiding. Is she hiding? No, nope, she's not hiding today because I said she's hiding. I have about two boas. Two, yeah, I have, I have two boas that like to hide and all the others don't really hide. 
I had this ball python in a home like this, so it had a lot of space, and I just want you to notice, I have a lot of empty homes. I can give them more space, and I try to give them more space, and I'm trying to downsize my collection so that each of my snakes can be living in more space. But sometimes you will offer, a, most of the time you can offer a snake more space and that'll be even better for them. But sometimes they do feel more secure in a smaller space. Now that's not true most of the time. It's true for some individual cases because some people say that, oh, they feel more comfortable in those little homes. And I truly do not believe that they feel more comfortable in the little home. But there are individuals. So this is an individual over here. See, it was in this big home. It wasn't doing well. And now I moved it back to a small home. And you see what it's doing? Even inside the small home, it's hiding under this little thing. So even within this little home, it's still hiding all the time. She doesn't eat well if I put her in the big home. If I put her in a smaller home, she hides most of the time and she eats well. Once they become a year old, then the males are starting to reach sexual maturity. They aren't really there, but so that first year, you're not going to have those problems with males fighting with males, males trying to breed females too early, and all those kind of issues that can come up. So once they hit about a year old, then I'll separate the males. So the males will end up living on their own, so like this, and this is a male. The male is kept on his own now, so from a year old, I keep the males on their own. I don't let them live with other snakes. I don't let them live with females. I don't let them live with males. And uh, as you can see, the calm personality and that calm snake that has been raised as a baby to kind of not fear anything or be feared by anyone stays with them. So now, other than breeding, this male will be left alone. When he's breeding, he'll be put with a female or two. I like seeing them together. I like seeing kind of how they behave. They do interact with each other and stuff. And people <laughs> disagree, but it's just like, I, I, I see it firsthand. I can see the way that they like, they hang out with each other and they interact. One year old, heading towards two, then they're separated, then they're on their own, then I don't have them together with anyone. Because they don't want them to breed too early, and I don't want them to try to breed a female too early either. So I had those two boys that were raised with this female, and they grew up together, and now they're on their own. So I separate them once they start reaching sexual maturity. So these are the most expensive snakes that I own. They're, they're like the rarest, they're the most expensive, so I want to give them the best that I can give them. And to me, that is this. It isn't taking them and putting them into little homes where they're by themselves the whole time. Because you'd figure if you know that's the best, that's your rarest animal, you wouldn't want to risk anything bad happening to it. And that's true, I, I wouldn't want anything bad to happen to these. They've now grown together for almost a year, and they all eat perfectly, they're perfectly healthy, they've never tried to bite each other, we've never had any problems, and, and they just all hang out together, and they're absolutely fine. Once again, I separate them when they, I feed them, I let them digest, and now what's going to end up happening is there are three girls, and there's one boy. So... Now look, when I reach in to touch them, just like all of my boas, I can go in and I can just touch them in the face and we're never going to have any problems. And I've seen countless times people showing their boas and their babies being scared and biting them or striking at them. And it's something that you'll never see from any of my snakes. And to me, this is part of the reason why. And people always say, you know, if you leave two snakes together, you'll end up with one snake eating the other. I've waited a long time to share this with people because it's just I knew that lots of people will disagree with this. You can say anything that you want. For eight years, I haven't had one snake eat another snake except for my Kribo. <laughs> 
I feed the dead, like, newborn, like, the dead snakes and stuff. I feed it to my Kribo, and she'll eat all the snakes she wants. If I took one of these and fed it to her, she'd eat it. But when it comes to boas with boas, they have never attacked each other. They've never tried to eat each other. And I've done this for litter after litter. I grow my litters in about groups of four and I grow them together in small groups and I get these results every single time. But this could be chaotic for most people. So like, let's say you did this and you didn't keep it as clean as I did. You didn't check them as often as I did and you have four snakes together crapping all the, over each other and then let's say you're feeding them and you're not separating them it would be an absolute nightmare so I just want you to understand very clearly the situations and the reasons and the time period because the same thing could happen is let's say I kept them together for two years instead of one year and now we have a male trying to breed a female that's too young to be bred most likely nothing would even happen but let's say a female that was too young got pregnant and then you lost a female from that or the males start arguing with each other or fighting with each other i've literally never seen two male boas fight with each other because i've never really put them together even when trying to breed some people will put two males together with a female really big breeders will do this and i don't disagree with it or anything but I'm just saying that they'll do that to get the competition going. They generally don't eat each other either. When I know that I'm going to breed two snakes together, even if they're like kind of different ages and whatever, sometimes I'll let them hang out together. Woo, Kyra, you made a nice crap. So let me tell you an interesting story. This is Kyra. She was originally Cairo. <laughs> Because I thought that she was a boy, and I thought that a white rat snake that I had named Steve, who used to be Eve, I thought Eve, I thought Eve was a male, and I thought that Kyra, no, I thought Eve was a female, and I thought Cairo was a male. It got hurt at the spine, and then from that point down, you can see problems in the spine. So at that point, I didn't really want to breed her anymore. I was just like, I'm going to just let her be. She's just going to be a pet and I'm just going to take care of her. But what ended up happening was he ended up laying eggs. So, so I found out that this one who I thought was a boy was a female. And I found out that Eve was actually a male. So Eve became Steve. And then it was just like, if this snake is just going to lay infertile eggs, interesting fact, but when snakes lay infertile eggs, it's harder on them than if they lay fertile ones. So I was just like, if Cairo is Kyra and he's gonna, she's gonna be laying eggs, I might as well just leave them together anyways. And it's really funny because that was, that was like five years ago. And ever since then, she hasn't laid any more eggs and she's hung out with Steve and they've always been good together. They've never had any problems. She's just a really, really sweet, gentle snake. She's a great, animal to kind of show to people, to spend time with, to let kids play with. She'll never bother anyone. So I'm just like, I'm going to introduce her to my scaleless male corn snake. And I'm just like, this is going to be, they'll just hang out. I'll leave, I'll leave them in. I watched them for a while. They were fine. So I left them overnight. And when I check the next day, the uh, scaleless corn snake was gone. And it's just like, oh my goodness, I, I, was, I was terrified and I read articles and it seems that you shouldn't have a, well, see the thing is Steve is bigger than her. So I, I figured, you know, if she's good for years with another snake without ever having aggression, because there are snakes like king snakes and Kribos and stuff that'll eat each other. But in general, like boas, ball pythons, corn snakes, they're not really like that. And she's fed well, but it's like, I looked at her and it was just like, she's full from here to here. And it's just like, I'm just like, you know, everything I've ever <laughs> kind of believed now. <laughs> it's like, it's the first time that a snake ate another snake. And it's just like, what a nightmare. Anyways, it turns out 
that there's a little crack of space in the top of the home and our wonderful little corn snake did not get eaten <laughs> and, and it, it was crazy that gave me a big scare because then it also made me feel like you know woo, like I guess no cohabilitating corn snakes. And once again, it's just, I, I don't usually do that anyways. I do it with the boas, sometimes with the ball pythons, because with the ball pythons, they don't, they don't do it. If I put four ball pythons in a group and raise them, they won't do as well as if I put them in pairs of two. So with the ball pythons, I keep them in pairs of two or I keep them singular. And I think that just ball pythons are automatically a little bit more scared than boas are. And because they're scared, they don't do well around each other. With boas, they have a bit more confidence. And because they have that confidence, they're not as afraid being around each other. Because they're just like, oh, it's you. They're not like, who are you? What are you doing? Oh my god. <laughs> Which is basically the ball pythons. Anyways, I wanted to tell you that story just to kind of make you think that one of my snakes ate one of my other snakes for a bit just <laughs> just to rustle you up or something who knows who knows okay so now we're leading into the final chapter of this discussion and that comes to breeding so now when it comes to breeding i raise my snakes thinking about how i'm going to breed them so, like I said, I'll start them off in groups of four, then I'll separate them, and I won't put the females back together until they're living in a home kind of like this, where it's, where it's bigger. I'll raise them first in a smaller home like this, then they get an upgrade to a home like this, and then when they get bigger, they go to a home like this. So... When I do raise them, I don't make them share homes when they're this size. I let them kind of be on their own and grow. So they're together for the first year of their life. And then usually they spend two years by themselves. So here's a boa that likes to hide under the newspaper. And uh, so you can see her size too. She's a little bit smaller than that last one. What are you waiting for? Do it! Just do it! Yes, you can! Just do it! You saw Venus, the other one. So I will raise them by themselves and let them be on their own for two years. So they're not together their whole life. They're together for the first year. They get their two years kind of by themselves growing up. And then I will keep females in pairs that I know I'm going to breed to the same male. So I'll have this female that I know I want to breed with this male and this female here I also want to breed with this male and I'll put them together and I'll let them hang out until I'm a hundred percent sure that one of them is pregnant so this one I'm a hundred percent sure is pregnant and now at this point I'll take these two I'll move them up to another home see the snakes and how they behave Even if she is, she's a little, don't bother me right now, but all of them. But she's also very pregnant. Yeah, she's also very pregnant. But I found that when, when breeding a male to multiple females, if I take one male, let's say I have a female here and a female here, and I put that male to this female, and then I put the male to this female, with my breeding males, Every three weeks, I give them a week off and I let them have a little meal. But when they're breeding, imagine this, okay? Week one, I put it with this snake. Week two, I put it with this snake. Week three, it has off and it's having its meal and relaxing. Then week one here, week two, week relax. That means that out of three weeks, the female snake will be only be with the male for one week. And that means that there's opportunities and there's times and I don't totally understand it, but there's like a window of opportunity. There's a time where it's a lot easier for the female to get pregnant. So by having two females together with the male for two weeks and then the male gets a week off and then two weeks in, one week off, 
I have that one male with those two females that whole time. So there's a much larger opportunity for him to get one at the right time. Now, once I'm sure that one is pregnant, then I will separate the male and female from the pregnant one. And I'll wait a while. I'll wait till I'm like a hundred percent sure because there's been times where you think they're pregnant and then they're not. So I'll basically take them till they're almost just about to lay. Then I'll separate that other couple. I will leave that couple alone without anyone else. And I will have that one totally by herself when she's giving birth. You definitely don't want any snakes in there with her while she's giving birth and all that stuff. So it's just watching them, understanding what, what's going on, knowing the timing. And then also sometimes I, I don't just want to breed a whole pile of things. Right now I only have two breeding males. So I'm not breeding anything else except those two males. So that one male is breeding those two females and the other male is over here. And you can see he's alone with Sophie. That's fine, that's perfect. So, yeah, just keep it there. So here we have Bond, and Bond came here from the UK. And Sophie, I've had Sophie now for eight years. And uh, she's just beautiful. I just never had the right snake to breed with her. So when Bond came here, I'm just like, that's his job. So he's not breeding with anyone else. He's only breeding with Sophie this year. So I'm only getting about three litters. I'm trying to get to the point where I have six females at the most that are like my adult breeders so that I have three females breeding a season and then they get a year off and then the other three breed. And I'm trying to kind of get into this system where I have less but just higher quality animals and breedings because eventually I want to move this area and give them homes that are almost double the size of this with like places for them to actually like climb on top of and a little bit of UV for them too. So that's like where I'm trying, the direction I'm trying to head in. I'm trying to get to a lot less animals in better conditions because I do want to give them more and more. And even little upgrades like I want to put if you can see here for my green tree pythons let's look in here so I've put in little things for them to hang on so I want to start doing stuff like that to all of the racks too so just kind of like building I want to build little things inside the racks where they can kind of climb and do other things instead of just kind of sit there doing nothing I'm a breeder, so I'm trying to be able to produce an amount of pets for people that people can have as really good pets that are like gentle, sweet, that will eat properly. So it's like my goal is to kind of be able to give that to people and to, to be able to serve enough people. I just do the best that I can. I hope that this all helped you understand my thoughts and the process that I use to do things and maybe it's got you thinking about stuff I hope so that's all I want you to do I want you to kind of like think about these things it might not be right for you and that's totally understandable this is just what works for me and kind of one of my little secrets to how I have animals that are super calm also giving them that extra time sitting around with them, holding them, watch a movie and hang out with them, take a timer. I like to have a timer on 10 minutes and whenever we have babies, usually I have friends over, but because of Corona, it's not really happening. But after Corona, invite your friends over, share the experience with them, put a timer on 10 minutes and you and two buddies, let's say, that's three snakes now. In 10 minutes, you've, ta you've held three snakes, then you switch to the other babies and you all hold those three snakes and you do it and that's kind of another nice way to get them extra comfortable with you. So if you want to see that, click on the first video. Otherwise, check out the second video.